This morning, Jesus would like to introduce you to his Father. And he would like to say to you that his Father is just like him. Our text said that God forgives of our sins that he may be feared. He forgives. Forgiveness is with him because he desires to love us. He wants us to love us in return. There was a father by the name of Joseph, and he had a son who had Down syndrome, who was 20 years of age. And the son was playing around in the backyard, and there had been some recent work being done at the septic tank, so there was an opening in the ground into the septic tank. And somehow, uh, Joseph, the Down syndrome boy, fell into the septic tank. And at some point, the father, Thomas, realized what had happened, and he dove immediately right into the septic tank and recovered his son. But it was so deep in there that all that Thomas, the father, could do was to just hoist his boy up above the sewage so that the boy could breathe. And the father was semi-submerged. And the commotion caused the family to come and look at what was going on in the backyard and they called for help and they tried all their efforts possible to try to pull both of them out of the, out of the sewage. And finally the rescue workers arrived and they were successful in pulling both father and son out of the septic tank. And the Down syndrome boy was alive, but all of the efforts to try to revive the father, Thomas, were unsuccessful and he perished in the sewage rescuing his Down syndrome son. A father, a father's love for his son. He died, he gave his life in order that his son might live. Jesus wants to reveal to us about his father and his love for us is the same. Amen. The same. The Bible is very clear that God is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. And the three are one. Jesus taught us how to pray and how to speak of God and how we are to look upon Him. He said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God desires for us to see him as our Father. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. He also promised Jesus that he would send the Holy Spirit to be with us forever. The Godhead is mentioned several times in the scriptures. It's a truth that in many respects can be understood because of what is revealed to us in the Bible, but in what is not revealed in the Bible is for us a challenge, human, humanly speaking. Our human abilities to understand completely about the Godhead goes far beyond our capacity. And there have been many sincere Christian people down through the years that have been baffled by the mystery of the, for, uh, of the Godhead. But has, the question arises, has Christ always been the Son of God, or did he become the Son of God when he was born into this world? And there is a prominent evangelical pastor to the south of us here who maintains that the sonship of Christ began at his birth in Bethlehem. But the Bible is very clear that the Son of God has always been the Son of God. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. By the way, just to side, Jesus is God's book. <laughs> he is God's Word. He is the Father's revelation to us of himself. 
a little understood truth, then they may help us to understand how to proclaim the Godhead to people like Jews and to Muslims and to other faiths of the world. A little misunderstood truth that we find in the Bible is 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, which says that God is agape. Yes, that's the original word. God is love, the kind that is forever. Amen. And I want you to notice the present tense that God has always, from eternity past to the present, and always will be in the future, agape. Amen. Agape is forever. Agape, love, cannot exist solitary. That kind of love just can't exist. Solitary, all alone. Love must have an object to love. Do you see that? Even from eternity, then, God must have an object to love. Therefore, the Son had to be there to be loved from eternity. And the Holy Spirit had to be there from eternity in order for the Son and the Father to love the Holy Spirit, too. The literal translation of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 says that the Father has translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His agape, the kingdom of His love. But we're not to try to understand the word Son of God in the light of our human father and son relationships. A father generates or begets a son. But we're not to understand the relationship of God the Father and God the Son in that way. God has chosen this specific way to reveal himself to us because we think we can, we can relate to that, can't we? we? We can relate to fathers and sons. For God to have a son doesn't mean that the father is older than the son. It means that they are of the same character. They are of the same essence. And of course, it is God is agape. That's the character, isn't it? That's the essence. And if God is agape, then the son is agape. And that is why the son voluntarily made himself subordinate to the Father, although they are equal in nature. Because agape subordinates its himself. Agape subordinates itself to one another. Now you can't really understand John 3.16, for God so loved the world, except that Christ has been the Son of God from all eternity. And so the love of the Father is revealed in its grandeur. The love of the Father is revealed in its grandeur because the Father has loved the Son from all eternity. And He sacrificed His only Son. He sacrificed His only Son, and He not only sacrificed Him, but He sacrificed Him to the second death. For us. For you. Amen. And someone once told me, Paul, hitch your wagon to a big idea and let it pull you. <laughs> and this is a big idea. This is, this is a grand idea. This is mind-boggling truth that we can't fathom. That God sacrificed His Son, His only one that He loved from all eternity. That is a huge idea for a puny little pea brain like me to understand. But I choose to believe it Amen. because the Bible says it. That's right. Amen. And you may choose to believe that too. That He loves you, that He sacrificed His, His Son for you, for us. So the understanding of the Godhead which the Bible teaches, I would say, is good news, wouldn't you? Amen. It's the gospel of the Godhead. It is grand good news. 
The Bible teaches in Romans 1.20 of his eternal power and Godhead. In Colossians 2 verse 9, it speaks of Christ that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in his incarnation, he was the fullness of God. The gospel then focuses our attention on this one nature, this one character, this one essence of the three persons of the Godhead, which is agape, divine love, which is a forever kind of love. The knowledge that we have of God is because he has taken the initiative to tell us. He has revealed himself in this way. So this is the reason why all that we know about God is from his initiative of love and therefore his love, his love is what drives, it motivates our faith in him. Amen. That faith has been given to every man. Measure of faith has been given to every man. It's been given to you. It's been given to me. It's what makes faith work by agape in Galatians 5 and verse 6. And so we have the capacity with your mind, with my mind, to believe with the heart that there is one God composed of three beings of agape. If we trace God's agape love back before time and creation, before God's desire to make human beings in His image, there existed love within the family of the Godhead. So before there were any angels, before any human beings, before any intelligent beings in the universe, there was this family trio of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Father has always had love for His Son from eternity, and the Son has always expressed His love for the Father by choosing to subordinate Himself to the Father, and the Holy Spirit loves the Father and the Son, and likewise does the Father and the Son love the Holy Spirit. And we are to understand the divine family not from our understanding of family relationships where a son is generated by a father and mother and thus are subordinate to the parents. Rather, we are to understand the relationship of the three divine persons as it is revealed to us in Scripture, that the three beings are equal in that they are co-eternal and each of them individually is the fullness of the Godhead but they are one God by virtue of their agape. Amen. Amen. Which causes them to be subordinate to one another. Wow. It's an, it is expressed in a mutual subordination of each to the other. But yes, the Father subordinates in His love Himself to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And likewise, the Holy Spirit and the Son. Here's what Ellen White says in the book Evangelism. She says, The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, invisible to mortal sight. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested, the express image of His person. The Comforter, that's her reference to the Holy Spirit, is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's in Evangelism, pages 614 and 615. So they are one God, by virtue of their agape. And it's expressed in a mutual subordination to one another. There's no independence, no one of them asserting independence over the other. There's no one person dominating any one of the three over the other. For such a, a assertion of individuality over others, 
is not in their nature of agape. No self-love. No self-love is the comment. Jesus taught his disciples the correct way to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven. You may choose to believe that. Because God has given you to the capacity to believe that that Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is your Father too. Amen. And that is a very important point. Because you say, well, it's easy to be reconciled to Jesus. But the Father and the Son, that's not so easy. But the plan of redemption is to reconcile us to God. And that is not only Jesus, but the Father and the Holy Spirit too. Amen. Our Heavenly Father is infinite, and at first thought this truth may tempt us to wonder if the comfort that He can give us is real and effective. How can it be if the Father is an infinite being? After all, He is sovereign of the whole universe. And when he wants something done, he gets it done. And if people are in his way, he just bulldozes them out of the way. He's the big bully of the universe. That's often our concept of God, the sovereign of the universe. But don't forget that he is also our Father, which art in heaven. And he was that to Jesus during his 33 and a half years of sojourn with us in this human life. And so whatever the Father was to Jesus, He's the same to us. Amen. An interesting little thought is that His being infinite, God the Father's being infinite, does not in the least lessen the personal attention that He gives to each one of us. Our Father gives to you His full 100% attention Amen. to you. Take, for example, the way that the Father in heaven manifested himself to Jesus. You know, believe it or not, Jesus was a teenager. He was a teenager. And what do teenagers like to do? They like to go to bed late, and they like to rise what? Late. <laughs> That's what teenagers like to do. And that's, Jesus was the same. He was tempted, you know, to, to sleep in till 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock. I know some children that you can't get them on the telephone until afternoon, you know. But the father, his father was his alarm clock and wakened him early in the morning from his sleep. The story is told in Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 and 5. It says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Man, you could unpack that. Uh, Jesus always knew the right thing to say to a weary soul, didn't he? He always had the compassion and the care and the tenderness and the right words to speak to any soul, a word in due season. But how did he know how to do that? It tells us in the text that the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. His Father taught him that. Amen. Well, isn't that how we learn as children? We learn from our parents, don't we? And from our teachers. But notice this part of the verse. It says of his Father, he wakeneth morning by morning he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned so the father was Jesus alarm clock and woke him up when he wanted to wake him up and began the school of the father with the son now as a teenager as a youth Jesus was a youth all his life among us here you know I look back well, he lasted here 33 years, right? Approximately, or 34 years. To me, 33 is young. That's a kid. You know, from where I'm looking at things right now. <laughs> I'm on the downhill side. So as far as I'm concerned, looking at Jesus, he was, he was a kid. He was a teenager. And that's when he ascended to heaven, when he was 33 or 34 years of age. But uh, he may have enjoyed sleeping in, 
But the Heavenly Father is the same Heavenly Father that you have and that Heavenly Father persisted in waking Jesus up as a teenager and he will do the same for you. Amen. And he will teach you. Jesus had to go to school. You say, what? Jesus? He had to go to school? Yes, he had to learn. You see, he had to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He had to learn how to speak a word in season to the weary crowds or to the solitary inquirer like Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. Jesus had to learn from his father what to say to Nicodemus in that nighttime conversation long after office doors should be closed. Those early morning awakenings and schoolings taught Jesus the wisdom that he needed so desperately, which is why he said, Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Amen. John chapter 5 and verse 30. And that same our Father which art in heaven will awaken us and he will teach us day by day. He will teach us. To whom did Jesus preach the Sermon on the Mount? Did he, did he preach to believers? Did he just preach to disciples? Or did he preach to a multitude on the Sermon on the Mount? Some say that God is not the Father of all humanity. Some people say that God the Father is only the Father to those who believe in Him. Some say that. All the rest who don't believe in Him are the children of the devil. That's what some say. But Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, reports in chapter 5 and verse 1 that Jesus saw the multitudes. When He saw them, He went up into a mountain and He preached in these words about your Father, which is in heaven. And He was speaking to the multitude. He was telling not just His disciples, not just to those who believed on Him, but to all of those 5,000 or more he taught them about your father. Your father. And after this manner, pray ye, our father which art in heaven. The Muslim, is, the Muslim is told that he must make himself pure before he will be accepted by Allah. The Muslim is taught that before he can come to Allah, he must purify himself. But Jesus says, come and I will make you pure. Amen. Amen. He became one of us so that he might invite us to regard his Father as our Father. True, there are many who are unconverted, but why? Is it because they have finally, irrevocably, determinedly rejected Christ? Or for many, is it because they have never understood the gospel? Are those who do not believe, are they wolves? Or could they be lost sheep who haven't been found yet? We know that Jesus said this, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John 10, 16. And in those words, he describes the soul-winning work of that fourth angel who comes down from heaven having great power and the earth is lightened with his glory. And that voice will call to those lost sheep, Come out of her, Babylon, my people, that you receive not of her plagues. And a wise writer says that Jesus, when he was baptized, a voice was heard from heaven declaring, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And when the Father spoke that to His Son, His voice embraced all of humanity in Christ. Amen. If you felt like you are an orphan without family, will you please accept the good news? The Father has adopted you 
into his divine family in Christ, in his beloved. If you felt like you've been on the outside of the house where the lights are shining brightly inside and you're out in the dark and you have no family, believe the good news that you have been adopted in Jesus Christ into the family of God. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, Jesus taught us to pray. You are as precious as that five-time loser woman at Jacob's well, where Jesus told her, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Amen. And He was seeking her. And He is seeking you. And in the day that He is seeking you, right now, come to Him as He's searching for you. You know, Satan is becoming more astute with his propaganda campaign of besmirching the character of God, and he has targeted Jesus' favorite word, Father, which he used to reveal the divine family. You know, fathers have really taken a licking, haven't they? Some, as justly do, because of their actions, and in other cases, it's been propaganda from various groups that have... Uh, just really flatten father images. But it's true that fathers deserve the licking that they are getting if they have abandoned their wives mm -hmm. in one form or another. Mm -hmm. Or their children to fend for themselves. That leaves lasting scars for life, doesn't it? Yeah. Lasting scars. Another licking that fathers have taken is, yes, some Christian groups, dare we mention, some priesthoods, not just Catholics, Episcopal and other sects of Christianity are supposed to have fathers, quote, in Catholicism that are celibate, celibate clergy. What a temptation that sets up for a man priest. Mm -hmm. What a temptation that sets up. And there's not a few priests who have abused their positions and power behind the altar or in the convent. What a licking the father image has taken from the Christian church itself. Mm -hmm. And then there's the feminist movement. Has done enough men bashing to deconstruct the whole patriarchal society idea. And it's come to the point where even within the church we hear prayers offered to the Mother God. By the way, the Holy Scriptures do not reveal that we are to pray to our Mother God. Our Father, which is in heaven, is how we are to address God. Mothers are viewed as the nurturing ones, the loving ones. But fathers now in our culture have become viewed as the distant ones, the unemotional ones, the uninvolved ones, the unapproachable ones. This is the image of Father today in our culture and in our society. And sometimes we humans have had earthly fathers who have just left us utterly bewildered and confused over the whole meaning of fatherhood, right? But Jesus had a mission when he came to this earth specifically to reveal to us the family of the Godhead and to reveal to us his Father and who he is so that we don't transfer that baggage to our Heavenly Father. And we may choose to believe in Jesus' Father. All things are delivered unto me, said Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. So Jesus is the only one who truly knows the Father. But then he says, And he, that is the Father, to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Jesus wants to reveal to you what he knows about his Father. Amen. 
You may choose to believe what he reveals to you about his Father. And there's marvelous instruction in self-denial, which is the highest wisdom. Everything is delivered into the hands of Christ, and he uses the power only to reveal the Father to men, while he himself remains unknown. Jesus, as it were, when he was on this earth, went about saying, he must increase and I must decrease. That was, that was John the Baptist who said that of Christ, but Christ could have said that the same of himself regarding his Father. The Father must increase and I must decrease. And so indeed the, the Son did decrease and subordinate himself. We speak of knowing Christ, but in knowing Him, we learn only of the character of God. And in seeing Him, we see God. Jesus said to Philip in John 14, verse 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. But yet we go around saying, I can relate to Jesus, but His Father, oh man, He's like Allah. He gets what He wants. No, that's not what Jesus says. If you want to know who the Father is, just look at Jesus. Amen. Just look at Him. And if Jesus subordinated out of agape love Himself to His Father, likewise the Father did with His Son. We read that Jesus emptied Himself, completely poured out Himself to the last drop, that the Father might appear in all of His glory. In all of the universe, no one knows the Son except the Father. And that was and that is the sacrifice of Christ. Looking down upon fallen humanity, His heart was filled with love and with pity, and He said to the Father, I will declare Thy name unto my brethren. And so he was content. Jesus was content to be despised. He was content to be unknown, to be misunderstood. Jesus was content to be rejected. And he did it without any complaint. Any complaint. Knowing that his Father understood him. Understood him in his heart. He did all of this for his Father. When God the Father was confronted with a world that is in Adam that had sinned and rebelled against him, did the Father drop an atom bomb on the world and say, all right, I'm going to create a new world? No. He did what the unfallen universe thought was unthinkable. The Father in heaven frankly forgave the whole lot of the sinners that were on this world. He frankly forgave them. Because if God marked iniquities, oh my, what would happen to us? But in Him there is forgiveness that He may be... What's that word? Loved, I heard. The text says feared. No, 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 no. It means that He may be loved. The forgiveness is that He may be loved. If you understand fear that way, there's okay to call it fear. But, you know, fear is a word that conjures up scaring. By the way, this will revolutionize our evangelism. I don't think we ought to be scaring the Bay Area. Do you? No. With our evangelism. No. Um, the last revelation to be given to the Bay Area is a revelation of the character of God's love. Amen. I know there are beasts in the prophecies, and I know that there's Satan out there, and people need to know, and I know there's a judgment going on, and they need to be warned of that, but should we be scaring people and driving them away from the Seventh-day Adventist Church? No. How about Christ for a better Hayward? Do we need a better Hayward? Do we need a better Oakland? 
Do we need a better Bay Area? Yes. But Bay Area, how about some beats? How about some Pope mongering? You know, how about how much God hates the sinner but loves the believer? How about Christ for a better Bay Area? Amen. Well, you say, well, that's far-fetched. Well, you know, the Lord can work miracles. <laughs> he can transform our evangelism overnight if we don't hinder him. Right now, there are discussions going on with the conference president and all of the pastors of the Bay Area of how to have a unified voice in speaking to the Bay Area. I'm really curious where they're going to come out with this. Is it going to be more fear-mongering? Or is it going to be Christ for a better, better Bay Area? A Christ who loves Hayward and can change it. Well, I got two part sermon here, so I better just drop this. Next week we'll have to go on to part two here. We suffer a very bad mental image of our Heavenly Father. We're suffering from that. I know that I, I pray every day. I say, Lord, you have given me a wonderful ministry to urban people who face unprecedented challenges like this world has never seen before. And philosophy and living in a culture that was like the days of Noah that precipitated the flood. And what can your poor servant who doesn't know how to come in or out, what can he say to people who are challenged like this and are on the streets every day? And all the Lord keeps impressing me to do is to preach the love of God. Amen. 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 By the way, this was a doctrinal sermon this morning, but you didn't know it, did you? But it was good news about the Godhead. And another little aside here, and that is that the word Trinity is never used in the scriptures. Godhead is. It's never used in the spirit of prophecy. Closest is that statement I just read to you about the heavenly trio and the three divine powers, you know. But there was a reason for that. Because the way that the doctrine of the Trinity evolved in the Christian church was through hate within the Christian church and murders over getting one's way as far as that doctrine was concerned. And there was no agape in it whatsoever. And any doctrine that is developed out of animosity toward any other group within the church cannot be truth because it divides rather than unites. And so I prefer to speak of it in biblical terms. God the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, three persons, Amen. but they are one God Amen. because they are all three agape, divine love forever. And that means they subordinate themselves to each other. Part two next week. Amen.